Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Juxtcast Season 5, a uh, special episode this week with uh, me, Malcolm Sparks. Me, Jeremy Taylor. Me, James Henderson. And I am Kent Beck. Special guest t- today is Kent Beck. Um, thanks, Kent, for, for joining. Great to have you with us. And uh, I, I think the reason we reached out to you was because of your recent articles on bitemporality, uh, which is, uh, if, you, if you just want to l- let us know kind of what led you to that writing the article and, and what for you was the, uh, uh, the origin story, if you like, of how you met bitemporality and started think about, thinking about it. Sure. I, I've been working with a, a group of folks in Switzerland uh, that now go under the name of Lifeware for uh, 25 years. And they introduced me to bitemporality b- back then. They were building a system to manage life insurance contracts. And it turns out the, the stuff that makes <clears throat> managing life insurance contracts hard just the actuarial math is complicated, but you can figure that out. The stuff that makes it hard is, oh yeah, by the way, uh, I deposited uh, another million francs uh, three months ago and I forgot to tell you, could you just fix that? And businesses respond to that, have responded to that traditionally with, uh, with the concept of closing. So you know, as of January 1st, we're going to close the books on the last year. And then we learn about these retroactive changes. And then we have special weird accounts that are called things like, you know, XXX underscore, please fix it. And you just post transactions kind of at random. And then forever afterwards, the automated processing for that contract is kaput. You can't do anything with it. So bitemporality was, uh, they introduced it as a way to be able to continue to efficiently uh, process contracts. Because you can just, I don't know, did your, did, do your uh, listeners know about bitemporality? Not necessarily. Some do, some don't, I'd say. Okay. So there's the idea that you have two timestamps to a piece of data, you guys know this, but I'm speaking to your audience now. You have two timestamps, one of which is when the fact became true in the world, and the other of which is when the system found out about it. And then you have these weird edge cases where, like the, oh, three months ago, I deposited a million francs, but I you know, forgot to tell you, which is today we found out about this fact, and when it was true in the world was three months ago. And and if we did processing in the meantime, assuming that we didn't have the million francs, then now we have to somehow reverse all that processing, take into account the new information we have and run forward for the past three months. Well, if you have those two timestamps, then, um, uh, then you're prepared to do that in, in a completely automated way that leaves you very efficiently processing uh, uh, all, all the contracts. Otherwise, you, you have all this, this kludgy, you know, post this weird transaction that nobody can. Two years later, you go back, well, what was that? I don't remember. I know we were fixing something and now we have another bug and, and, and. And so the big insurance companies just have C's of, people with actuarial math backgrounds with calculators manually processing stuff, which doesn't scale well, is error prone and is extremely expensive. So I, I don't, by the way, I don't like the name by temporality. I think that it's the classic geek naming mistake of naming something after the implementation and not the intention. Did you, you had a tweet about that recently, Ken, about it is a bad name, and you solicited people to suggest alternatives. Did did you did you get many? That we, I, I saw the thread, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I got I got lots of them, and I didn't like any of them. So, but but that it uh, pissed me off enough to to uh, spur my own uh, my own preferred name for it now, which is uh, and this is uh, this is a worldwide reveal exclusive here. And I'm not, it, it also, anyway, so here, I think 
it should be called eventual business consistency. And, and what we mean, the, the purpose of bitemporality is that we recognize this distinction between system time and real world time. And we recognize that because eventually the two aren't perfectly in sync, number one. And number two, we're going to sort it out. So that's the eventual, and it's by the problem with the name is it's by analogy with eventual consistency from distributed databases, which is a really geeky concept that business people probably won't be thrilled to, you know, if they know it, they won't be thrilled to be pulling that one out of the archives. So it's still not a good name, but it's way better than by temporality. <laughs> this is the thing I think, I mean, by, by temporality often gets a, um, a, a lot of negative press because it, it's, it seemed to be quite difficult. It seemed to sort of in, increase the complexity of your system. Um, I, I actually think, so lo looking at it, I, I don't actually think it does, um, I, I don't think it, it sort of unjustly increases the complexity. Like the, all, all, what, what by temporality is doing is unearthing issues that are there anyway. And giving you and giving you tools to talk about them and reason about it. Um, so it's uh, where, whereas uh, um, in any in any other system these would be ad hoc solutions, uh, the, as you say, sort of pledges um, where, where you do have all of these very manual processes. But uh, um, as as with a lot of things in computer science, if we can put a, if we can put a name on something, um, and we can we can talk about the concepts, that that, that then I think gives us a lot of um, I say a, lot, um, a very good tool with which to deal with this kind of complexity. Yeah, I have to say one of the things I don't like about the word bitemporality is it doesn't have the oomph that factor. It doesn't really spell out how foundationally uh, different it is when you have the security of this kind of bedrock up beneath you. And the only thing I can really compare it to, uh, and this is kind of an analogy, is when uh, source code control became a thing or when it became popular. And I was going to yeah. ask... Um, Actually, you ask everybody when, if they remember the first time they, they, you know, you came across source code control. Do you remember that that time, or was that, is, is that too distant, Kent? Sure. Now, it was interesting because I was working in Smalltalk uh, at the time, which has its own no notion of of uh, version control, and. Uh, and if you're programming by yourself, it's good enough for pretty much everything you do. But um, yeah, then version control came to came to Smalltalk as larger and larger teams were using it. And yeah, I mean, it's in a it, it was an adjustment for sure, but it's way better than just uh, creating tarballs and emailing them around and putting them in a directory with special file names yeah I, I think that's yeah that's how i remember source code control when I, I in the 80s trying to write a computer game and having backups on floppy disks and i just had i think three floppy disks and that was the that was the previous version of the code was the um it was the backup and uh, yeah you see what the, the practices that people have when they don't they don't trust the system to keep the old data so they they copy things they copy documents and they call them underscore version two final dot doc or something or and i think you see practice today in the world of data where people will take a snapshot of a database and you put it in a data lake and that was that snapshot was taken and they could push it into something like BigQuery, and then they can query it later that is really how people survive without by temporality but I, the reason I like the version control, the source code control thing, is because it is much, much better. Developers understand it's so much better to have principled version control in your in your code, and so there's a kind of element of safety, knowing that I can make a a bad commit or I can break something and I can go back. Um, and and I just wanted to introduce this concept of safety because this is something that's really dear to your heart, I think, uh, Ken, about you know your personal mission. So uh, after 20 years of doing a wide variety of things, worked on uh, testing tools with the J unit and it's the, that whole family, worked on test driven development. So a work, a detailed workflow for, for programming, I was working on process, 
I uh, was working on economics of software, just a whole bunch of different things. I took a step back and said, well, like, th this seems like a hodgepodge. Is there any common thread to all the things that I've been doing? And uh, after enough cogitation and splitting wood and doing other things, the phrase that popped into my head is, I'm here to help geeks feel safe in the world. Now that what does that mean? But I mean, that's the phrase. So when the muse speaks, you know, don't, don't ignore it. But, but what does it mean? And I, I realized for me, it means two things. As geeks, oftentimes we feel afraid in situations where we're actually safe. So for me, a cocktail party would be a great example of a situation in which I'm just like, I'm trying to track, keep track of all the conversations Am I talking too much? <clears throat> Am I responding to this person enough? Should, have we been talking too long? Should I talk to somebody else? What was that? That sounded interesting. I need to turn and 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 answer that question because I happen to know the answer to that question. Except that would be rude. Wouldn't that be rude if I was turning away? But uh, uh, oh my god! So my my kids have a, a series of of pictures of me uh, asleep at parties. Because it would just be exhausting. So turns out there are techniques that you can learn to feel safe even in those kinds of situations. It's never going to be my home base. I'd much rather speak to one-on-one -on -one or in a small group like this uh, or to a thousand people in an auditorium. Those are I'm perfectly fine with any of those. But the 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 kind of that cocktail party conversation. It's just always going to be difficult for me, but I can feel safe. I can realize I'm fine. Nothing bad's going to happen to me. So that's one, one part of it is kind of the, is the personal development side where I'm actually safe and I feel unsafe and I can learn techniques so that I can feel safe. But the other side of it is there are times when geeks feel unsafe because they're actually doing harmful stuff in the world. They're creating bugs, they're, they're damaging relationships with customers or with their colleagues, they're actually unsafe. And that feeling of being unsafe is, is an accurate reflection of reality. And in those cases, something like test-driven development can help. I reduce the defect rate, uh, and now I'm that much safer. And so I realize, yeah, like, of course I deploy on Fridays. Of course, I deploy on Fridays at 4.30. If I have any question about deploying on Fridays at 4.30, I'm going to dig into that issue and make sure that deploying on Fridays is, is perfectly safe. And that'll, that'll slow me down. But in the end, I, I get to enjoy my weekends and everybody goes faster. So that's the two sides of the feeling safe in the world. One is feeling safe when you're actually safe. And the other is being safe when you're actually acting in an unsafe way. Did that answer your question, Malcolm? Yeah. 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 I was just yeah thinking about that safety thing. And I, I always, well, I've felt real fear in my career and, and not, not often, but um, the times that I felt it have, have really like influenced me. And I, I want the, to, the, the, I think the most afraid I've ever been is joining a bank a big risk engine team and very early on being asked to go on support overnight and they had this support phone this mobile phone that had this horrible ringtone i can still remember it now and you had to take this phone with you for the weekend and i would just pray and hope it would not ring and sometimes it did and it would be 3 a.m. on a Saturday, and I would have to do all this dialing in and things and going to, trying to get these, I think it was called Power Broker, trying to get access to the system. And when I did, I didn't know how the system worked. I couldn't find the config, I couldn't see the source code control, or you couldn't see the source code. And it was just, you know, it was like, I just had to try things and and uh, you know, i mean the whole thing was so messy and it was like a wild goose chase trying to figure out why a configuration value was something and i had to learn the system at you know four o'clock in the morning under stress that i had to i had to solve the problem by 4 30 or the bank would lose its risk for the day or you know and that was 
horrible and that taught um, me a lot about the importance of clear documentation or clear configuration and, and really simple systems that don't have all this complexity in them which is sort of occlude how how the thing works um, James have you uh, you you um, you've been afraid in your career um, I, I can't I can't well I mean aside from sort of generally developing XTDB and sort of pu pushing a release out knowing that you're knowing that you're responsible for a lot of other people's data I mean that that one I don't I, I think if I ever felt completely safe there I think I'd, I'd, I'd feel a bit too cavalier if you like that there is a sort of genuine sense of responsibility of like the there's a lot of um, uh, yeah, there is a lot of response there is a lot of responsibility that goes with creating a database. Um, but the, but one that does particularly spring to mind actually was when I was um, work, working with you on that on that same project. I think I think you were on your paternity leave, so I got the I got the call. <laughs> um, a sort of fresh faced grad, um, and yeah, it was it was two o'clock. It was I think the, the week before Christmas. Um, this is this is sounding very much like a fairy tale, isn't it? Um, the week before Christmas, all, all was quiet through the house, um, and uh, the, yeah, the, the call was about all, the, all of the different systems, and they, they hadn't quite like none of, none of the different systems had got their data through in time. Like there was there was one system that was running behind, and I remember that causing a huge knock on in in terms of all, all of the systems that then, as you say, couldn't couldn't process their their end of day, and it was. Um, a I think, and you'll correct me on this one, Malcolm. I think it was a triple witching day, if you remember the term. Yeah. Term? yeah. It was once every um, every three months on the third Friday of the month or something. Or yeah, the four and, busy days and, of the year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, I can remember all the different all the different teams then trying to coordinate. And again, I mean, it comes it comes back to that sort of that bitemporal example, doesn't it? Of okay, how how are we going to unpick this? Because now we've now we've got systems that have run end of day on previous days' data. Um, and how on earth do we begin the process of picking this? Um, and, and thankfully, being I say, thankfully being the grad, there are a lot of people there who are a lot more experienced than I. So I was, I was sitting rather quietly on that call at two o'clock in the morning. I, I remember. Uh, I think I remember a time, James, where you might, have, where you were. I did put you through some fear, and that was. Um, <laughs> I was about to give a talk for a conference. I think it was Code Mesh, and the night before we were having drinks, and James and I were just having a pint or something. And then I got a call from my wife to say she just gone into the labor ward about to have our our daughter and would i and so i had to leave and i had to say to james james here are my slides would you give my talk tomorrow and i think you did a great job but that was uh, yeah that that, that that was uh, perhaps quite a cha challenge i think so um just sorry just to finish off an answer i think that a lot of the um a lot of the times that i have felt fear um it, it's come around things that i um or, or changes that i very much feel are irreversible um, so ch changes that, for example, can lose me data, um, or, or that that kind of thing. And I mean, sh I mean, maybe I'm maybe I'm the paranoid type, but I think that there's a, like no matter how many backups you've got, you've still got this you've still got this feeling of right, okay, I'm about to do something destructive here. Um, and that that's one of, that's one of the feelings that I'd absolutely love to get away from. Like no, knowing that no, no matter what I no, no matter what happens in this in this database migration, for example. Like I, I, I know that I've, I've still got something to, I've still got my, my old beds to fall back on. Well, I, I, that's the point of backups. In any case, is that <clears throat> you say, ah, we'll just restore it. Ha <laughs> ha. Assuming you can restore it and you actually have the backup and you can restore it and it fits back in, then yes, you've, you've created reversibility. So the irreversibility is one of the, one of the factors that I look at in creating safety for sure, which is why I love the, I don't know, is your database append only? Um, but through, through by temporality, yes. Yeah, so you can't, you can't edit system time. Um, Got it. And can you, can you delete records that are, that once you've uh, committed them? Uh, you can delete records once you committed them, yes. But I mean, in, in by, um, again, with as as a standard in by temporality, um, you, you delete the record from the from the current view of the world, uh, but you've still got access to going back in system time and seeing what was what was the state like at, at that point in time. Oh, interesting. So so deleting means uh, you post a new record with the same effective date but a different posting. A later posting date is that correct 
Yes, yes. So we'll we'll, we'll update it in um, in system time. Um, so the, a new a new fact will go into the system, and that may well delete some entities. Um, but I but I can ask questions of the system in in different ways. And the majority of the time, I'm going to ask questions of the system, like what what's the state of the system right now. Um, but I but I can then make um, essentially two different types of historical queries. Um, one is going back in valid time or going back in business time. Um, and that's most like um, most likely when you want to know um, the history of an entity as we best know it. So this is this is taking into account all of the corrections. Um, this is the systems that have run late. We want to take their data into account as well um, and pretend we had it at the time. So that, that's one we call that we call that going back in valid time. Um, and the other one is going back in system time, which is more for audit purposes. Like what what exact data did we have on Tuesday at 4 p.m. when we made that decision? Okay, so it was it was a bad decision. Um, and the reason we made that bad decision was that actually we didn't have that data at the time. And, and had we had that data at the time, we may well have made a different decision. So you call those, you call the two times system time and valid time? Yeah, the, the, the names, I think, as, as is typical for our industry, I think there's so many different names for those things. Um, right. That's, that was the point I was going to bring up. The, the, if we would like to see bitemporality used more widely, we're going to have to come up with better names and and uh, uh, and move towards the purpose of it and not the implementation. So, uh, uh, at life where we use uh, posting and posting is the system time and effective is the valid your valid time yes yes so um well there, there's a couple of there's a couple of names i think that are more prominent than or seem at least to be more prominent than others um so in in the early bitemporal literature um from from snodgrass and, and very which is snodgrass and various different types of people um it was um tra uh, transaction time and valid time so tra transaction time was the point, yeah, point at which we um, the system found out about the data and then valid time being essentially business time um sql 2011 then specifies it as as system time and application time um, in the in the in the spec, so <laughs> okay, go okay, figure. Um, and I've, I've seen so many other sort of effective time, event time, business time, domain time. You, you name it. There's loads. There's loads. In in German, effective time is the valuta, which I kind of like. Does that have a Does that have a translation, or is that the effective time? Right, it is effective time. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we could start introducing some German words into. Well, okay, okay. So, so having been involved in a few of these kind of movementy things, having a little bit of your own jargon is uh, is a, a, a shibboleth. You know, it's that. Are you? Do you really understand? So, I don't. I don't mind having special words for special things. It, it creates a barrier. I like. You look at the lean manufacturing stuff, and and there's all these Japanese words that people use all the time, and. And it is kind of a, uh, you know, are you wearing the right kind of T-shirt sort of signifier of if you're inside or outside, which we can. D does this go out on video or is it audio only? Yeah, a video too. Okay. Well, then the people on video can see. Uh, you all have your, your black Jux shirts and I don't. Whatever the opposite of that. I, I liked uh, what you're saying about um, the best way to come up with a name or like better terminology around this is is to think about the use cases and um, what you've described so far is about the uh, history or like you know what's actually happened in the past. In your experience, have you encountered situations where you want to schedule or put things in the in the future? Because we we have actually found some scenarios. Oh, oh, absolutely. It's the the less leveraged. Uh, uh, a use case. It, it, yesterday, I I um, scheduled a wire transfer for next Tuesday. That's that's great because it's off my mind. I can. I knew I had to do it. There, there was problems if I don't do it. Now it's off my mind because I could. The the system time is today, and the the wait the the <laughs> the. I posted it yesterday, and the effective date is uh, uh, is is next Tuesday. And so, so saying, well, I'm going to move in two weeks. You know, the usual business systems answer to that is 
tell me in two weeks. I or or just get your mail at the wrong place for the next two weeks. You those are your two options. And being able to make prospective changes is uh, is uh, simplifies a number of business processes. Absolutely, it, it, it's it's a less leveraged capability, but it certainly is there, and and I've used it. Yes. So from our experience, um, I mean, one of the reasons we got into building XT was was because uh, we were working on uh, reporting systems and. They're regulated reporting systems, which mean you have this sort of extra level of accuracy required and um, or, or auditability required. And uh, so, so, so that sort of is one area of use case, the sort of reporting regulation. Um, but yeah, I, I, we've also worked with uh, users, customers in, in the space of um, like e-commerce, where they're trying to schedule pricing updates, things that change in the future. They, you know, they've agreed different contracts with suppliers. They know that the, the promotion is going to be effective at this point between these two dates. Um, and uh, I think actually there's a huge amount of value. I agree with uh, what can be built for, for, for doing things in the future. Um, so uh, regardless of which domain we look at, I think there are good use cases. But um, what we found working on a database uh, is um, like, uh, yeah, people can get by like adding columns to SQL schemas, for instance. Um, and they will build up technical debt because it makes their queries more complicated. But they can sort of get by. But it, it, it's, it's, it's just hard enough to implement that it's not really worth moving to like a whole other database technology and, and risking a project with a novel technology. Um, but ultimately, it's, it sort of seems to be this impediment that's holding things back. And I just wondered if you had any tips or thoughts about how we approach this strategically you know, as, a, as an industry to, to move from uh, you know this this local maxima of Postgres, which you know still doesn't have the SQL 2011 um, specification. Like, how how do you think we should be approaching this? Well, I think it's important to recognize that businesses have figured out workarounds for all the problems that we're solving in better ways with by temporality. That that we're not solving problems that aren't being solved. So whether it's you put post its on your screen that says send a wire next Tuesday. Or you have this weird, you know, a year-end closing after which you can no longer change any data, which makes you create these crazy transactions that screw up. Like businesses solve the problem one way or another. Um, and what w it, the f the first thing is just to help people notice that they're they're feeling pain. They've got a pebble in their shoe. Yes, you think this is just how business processing has to be, and it's not. There's, there's, you have options. So that's the the first thing is bringing that to people's awareness, and then saying, okay, and yes, there is a cost. Yes, this is more complicated than two timestamps is more complicated than one. Absolutely, and once you're used to it, you've got the pebble out of your shoe, and. Uh, everything else that you do is going to run much more smoothly. And, and you know, people get attached to pain. They, uh, they're afraid. They, they know that they're solving a difficult, dangerous problem. And they'd like to, uh, uh, like, they, they can get attached to the chest beating of, yeah, yeah. We make retroactive changes all the time with no backups. Ha ha ha! It's not something to be proud of, but uh, in any case, yes, yeah. I think I mean one, one of the things I like about these these kind of things, um, and it, it comes back it comes back to the point of putting putting a good name on it, um, is that you, you can then look around and see sort of what what other problems have these folks solved. Like okay, so let, let let's say I buy into buy temporality, um, and then and then you recognise, well, hang on a minute. Yeah, you know what? I've got that problem as well, and here's how they've solved it. Um, and that, yeah, that's that's applied to me sort of a few times, I think, through my um, through my career, um, where you just don't you just don't know the concept. It's like it's like version control. Like you've, you've probably got your own workarounds. If like before you, before we knew about sort of um, for for me it was for me it was SVN at uni for it. So. Um, but, but before we had that, our group projects were sort of as you say, yeah, we'll, we'll put this folder on the shared drive, and you, you got these workarounds. But then you look at you look at version control and you go right. Oh, look at look at all these different things that that now brings me. Um, things that I wouldn't have recognised. And so it's a it's a big step change, I think, in, in terms of how you can think about your your craft. 
Um, I was going to talk a little about your, um, you know, going back to extreme programming, and the 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 thing the the, the word extreme. I think, and it sounds like it, it, it came from this idea that you have an idea, good or bad, and you apply it to its extreme. You turn it up to 11, and you say, what if, if we just do this? So that you don't constantly have to say, oh, should I be using this technique, or should I be testing this config file, or should I be... You, you just say, look, we're just going to test everything. We're going to, you know, in almost a very simplistic way, so you don't have to think about the context, and you just do things. So, yeah, we're just going to... We're always going to pair program. Right, and we're going to get every line of code written as a pair, and then we don't have to, you know, make all these kind of complex rules about when we pair program and when we don't. And I, I think, you know, how do you think that that um, this idea of, of like just taking a principle and just saying, well, if you apply it completely, a hundred percent, you get different characteristics that come out. And I was going to sort of think about this. If you, there are some things that if you just make perfectly work in a system you forget about and then you just move on to another thing and i i would argue garbage collection was for me that moment where i was struggling yeah. writing these c plus plus servers and having these core dumps and i would take the core and run it through a debugger and try to find out where it would you know and it was always a, a memory pointer that went hairy and thing and i remember the the first time I had the same kind of bug in Java, Java just come out and it gave me a stack trace and it gave me, you know, but it carried on working and it completely changed what I could sort of achieve as a, you know, not so great programmer back in the 90s trying to do stuff. The garbage collection took a, away a big problem for me. And I just want, want other, other, other things that are just, and, it, that, and I feel that XP kind of recognized that, that it was, there, there are just some things, if you do consistently, you reach a level where you can transcend that and, and not have that problem again. So uh, f for the young folks here, extreme programming is a uh, <clears throat> team style of software development, collaborative style of software development that um, emphasizes uh, deferring as many decisions as possible and uh, and enabling that by increasing feedback loops at every possible level. So if you get great feedback, then you don't have to make good decisions because you can afford to just make a decision and you'll find out. Uh, what I had noticed was that people were trying to avoid mistakes and they would bend over backwards and make enormous numbers of mistakes trying to avoid the mistakes. And I thought, well, what if we just turn that on its head? What if we just had as much feedback as possible? What, what is that? What kind of behaviors does that enable? So this is, uh, I started working on software process in maybe mid nineties and, um, this was one of the streams that flowed into the, how spicy do I want to get? Uh, Agile, I was playing poker the other day and I keep kind of a low profile at poker. I try not to, you know, and I live in San Francisco and a, a lot of people would know who I was if I reveal it. So I just like, don't talk about it because I'm just playing poker. And somehow a guy figured out who I was and he just started going off on this agile stuff and what horrible damage it had done to the world. I just said, man, I'm playing poker. Um, so yeah, the agile stuff, I, I, we can, that's a very separate conversation, but anyway, the extreme programming was an influence on that. Um, so how do you come up with a new process? You're, you're in some kind of local minima where you have these documents and these sign offs and the phases and the quality gates and the reviews and all. So if you want to get from there to some lower energy state where you're spending more time actually creating value, how do you do that? And Malcolm, as you said, my strategy was to say, let's take the small number of things that we absolutely know we have to do. We have to code. 
We have to write tests because we make mistakes while we're coding. So we need to double check our work and we have to talk to customers. We know those three things absolutely have to happen. So let's just do those as intensely as we possibly can. And then we'll t all of the phase gates and the flu flus and the chicken sacrifice and all that other stuff. We're just going to toss it out the window and see what happens. This is a learning exercise. And I think that's important to emphasize. This isn't how you ought to program. This is a, this is a way for you to learn how you can program better by taking the things that you're doing and either dropping them and seeing what happens or intensifying them and seeing what happens. So, XP is very much a play to win, not a play not to lose strategy, which it turns out organizations have uh, very effective ways of punishing if you're playing to win instead of play not to lose. But yeah, w whatever. You know, I'm a geek. I want to geek better. So M Malcolm, does that, am I getting to the points you were looking for? Yeah, I think it's a, 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 the, the um, just echoing that, allowing you to make mistakes, um, that is that is part of uh, um, allowing you to feel not afraid. I can make a mistake. I'm a human. I might be working for an organization that punishes mistakes and so that and that changes my behavior. I'm, I'm going to make sure I check everything and I, you know, and I'm going to go much, much more slowly. And I'm perhaps I'm going to game the system a little bit so I look good. Um, but, sure. you know, and so the, the thing that really struck me um, when I first met you, Kent, in Dublin, it was about, uh, well, I know it was about the year, 2000 or around that and um it, we were all working in our little cubes or our little but you know individually on our our machines and um that was the first time you know you coming in actually working with my colleagues on the same problem and seeing the difference that pair programming made and how your your knowledge of the different parts of the system that you might be afraid of and you didn't understand by working every day with your colleagues you would get that sort of group shared understanding uh, which is has left a big imprint on me actually that the sort of as you as you have a chance to understand your code you can sort of see well that bit we don't need that's a bit messy that can be refactored and, and you 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 proceed with being able to improve a system through you know understanding and and the tests are also f for me give you a very important piece of understanding is did i just make something break uh, yeah yeah, but we're used to we're used to that feeling. Did I just break something? And we think we have to live with it, and we don't have to live with it. And that's terrifying to some people, and I understand that. But it's true that we don't have to live with that intensity of that feeling. I think just, I think just sort of refine that um, the refine the point we've been making there. I think the um, you need a sense of degree of safety within the organisation to be able to use these kind of processes. That, um, and I think that that's that's maybe one place where I've, I've been anecdotally struggled in the past is where, where you do have um, so I, I mean I guess I guess it's sort of sort of the, the perils of siloed organisations where you have very a very distinct sort of technical department a business department. And these kind of things, and in the, in those kind of environments, I've, I've certainly found it a lot more difficult to to bring in these kind of practices, um, because as you, because as you say that the the playing not to lose is is real, right? It's... Yeah, yeah. The, the, there's reasons those incentives were created, and they're very powerful and they're very stable because we're in this local minima. Yeah. So one of the things in extreme programming is. This is when this is before remote work was a, a reality. So you, you sit together in one room. No, no cubicles. You sit together in one room, and the customer is sitting there with you. And people say, "Well, if you have the luxury of having a customer sitting with you, then development would be easy." To which I say, "Okay." Like. You, you could, I, I remember watching, uh, my son was a, a jock and he played racquetball at the national level. And I remember watching, there was one kid who would take two or three more steps. Everybody else would like reach out to hit a ball. And this kid would take two or three extra steps until he was perfectly positioned to make an easy shot. 
And everybody else was saving energy by reaching out to, to hit things. But he would just get into the perfect position. And I, I remember thinking, well, that's, that's it. Like, if you say, well, if you, if you, have a, 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 if you can talk to a, a, a customer just any time, you can say, hey, what's going on with X? And they just answer your questions. Well, then development's easy. Okay. If you can push a button and you got red or green, is this ready to deploy? Or if you have that luxury, then of course development's easy. Okay. If you have safe ways ways to communicate with your fellow geeks as you're making changes, well, then sure, if you have the luxury of doing that, then development's easy. I'm like, why in the world are we making it so hard? That's the part I don't understand. I don't, I don't think it'd be a conversation with closure developers without someone mentioning sort of the, the REPL for bringing similar kinds of safety there as well, and then increasingly um, like bettering the feedback loops. Uh, that, that whole idea that I can that I can ask my system questions and um, and, and get yeah, as you say, instant feedback on uh, on on the on the changes I'm making. If you had a stopwatch and you said, okay, I built equivalent systems in C plus plus and in closure. Uh, and you have a random question to ask of your system. It's going to be a hundred to one, a thousand to one. You're going to get that feedback faster. And and the the flip side of being able to get feedback faster is is reversibility. You you can just make decisions, get the feedback on them, and then make a different decision in far shorter time than it would have taken to try and meditate carefully about that same decision and then come to the perfect, correct decision, which is then going to encounter reality and then you get the feedback anyway. So, but I, yeah, I don't, I don't understand. Some, some form of geek masochism that we just like, Ugh. I want to be terrified. I want to build a system. Maybe this is Frankenstein. Maybe Mary Shelley had it. We just want to build a system that we're terrified of. That 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 proves something about our abilities. That we can make a system that that nobody else can understand and we can't even understand. Ha 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 ha. But it's okay because we got through it, right? We we battled together. We battled through it, and we're a, yeah, we're a strong stronger people as a result. <laughs> yeah or, or i'm special i'm that just proves i'm smarter than everybody else which of course it doesn't i i think uh I, you know i was just going to make a comment that um i i i think that some of the pra the original xp practices and there were i think there were 12 were they kent the the original yeah. list and so one was test driven development uh the other another one was continuous integration and these things have really been successful. I think th these have definitely been adopted. CI, CI for sure, TDD. Ugh. There's these stupid religious wars around it. Fine. It does require a different style of design than people are used to. Fun it works much better with functional code than with imperative code. And people are very used to working in an imperative style. And then they blame TDD. Oh, I just, my brain doesn't work that way. Or there's just stuff you can't test or whatever. Well, there's stuff that's hard to test. Sure. There's a different design for that same code. So that's been my, my latest really geeky focus besides poker is, uh, is software design. I think software design is a, uh, why uh, uh, underdeveloped muscle for developers. Um, and b both in terms of technique, but also in terms of, of uh, like understanding the theory and purpose of it. So I'm writing a book right now and I have a, uh, here's my commercial shill, tidyfirst.substack.com is a uh, uh, newsletter that has a, a paid component, which I, I've just been sending out everything to everybody anyway. But anyway, I've been, uh, as I complete chapters of uh, this book called Tidy First, question mark, I post them uh, on that mailing list. 
So consider subscribing. Yeah, I, I mean, I was going to make the comment. I think, think some of the, some of the XP practices are like continuous integration has has spawned a whole industry. Let's say, I mean, there's a the, there's a whole load of products and there's kind of practices and people doing pipeline, build pipelines, you know, GitHub Actions and Circle CI, all that stuff. You know, spawned out of this practice that you you kind of. Um, I was going to ask, was that something just as a by the way, what, what, continuous integration? How did that come about? That that. Uh, that particular practice. So it was. I had the principle of we're going to do the things that we do as intensely as possible, and we're going to discard everything else. And we know we we had a team of I think twelve people, and we knew we needed to integrate changes. So the question is, how often should you integrate changes? And so we just uh, I I challenged the team. He said, well, what, you know, what if you did an hour's worth of work and then you integrated, which seemed like, yeah, it's crazy fast. You couldn't possibly, hence the word extreme. The fun, one of the funny things about picking that word extreme. So in the UK, you've got the new forest, right? Which is a thousand years old or something. And so it's, you have to be careful with naming. You call something the new forest and it's going to stick and then it's going to be stupid. And extreme is another one of those. It's it, the, the name stuck, but some of the, some of the things where we thought, well, you know, what if you deployed once a week? Whoa. What if you, you know, re, uh, re, uh, uh, uh planned your schedule once every three weeks? Oh, it's crazy. Um, and then it turns out you can do it a lot faster. So anyway, uh, we knew we had to integrate. I just said, let's just integrate after an hour. And it was all about really about those tight feedback loops. And, and sort of the thing that I was mulling right. over is, is has in, in certain, certain sections of the industry has kind of lost what it was all about in terms of the feedback loops. I mean, sometimes you have all of these practices that are, you know, we're going to build all this you know, infrastructure and DevOps, and we're going to do, do all this stuff and infrastructure as code, and we're going to have this wonderful thing. But you don't know, you don't get any feedback for ages and ages until lots of things have to come together. And I, right. I, I just think you know, going, um, and it, uh, I was just um, uh, thinking around. I, th I think one of your podcasts you did fairly recently around the, the test, commit, uh, reject. Is that right? Have I uh, te uh, uh, t TTR test? Uh, commit revert and, and that you, you kind of get into super fast integrations because you can see why if you don't have continuous integration asking the question does it work well you've got to wait until jenny has finished her work because she's working on something you and then the, and then the build pipeline runs which which might be hours I mean, back in the day, Malcolm, I don't know if you remember this, but a C++ build might take 48 hours to complete. And then, and then we brought that down to seconds. And then we decided, nah, this is easy mode. Let's, let's, uh, let's create build pipelines and still take an hour, maybe two hours. Yeah, so, so it, right, the people have lost sight of the purpose of getting rapid feedback. And you get rapid feedback, not just because it's fun, because it enables this reversibility for technical decisions. And when you have reversibility for technical decisions, you're more creative, you're more energized, you communicate better, you collaborate better with other people, uh, you, you waste less time on dead ends because you just try stuff. That's the... That's the sequence. You 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 want rapid feedback to enable all these these great epiphenomenon in software development. And organizations that punish feedback, if it's negative, will very naturally evolve systems that reduce the uh, frequency and the quality of feedback. And and then you're back in that that old local minima of phase gates and reviews and sign offs and piling risk on risk on risk. Yeah. The, the ability to fail, fail really fast and be able to course correct, just, just have that 
everywhere. So if it is a re you know if you have a language with a REPL, great because if you but you know if you if you can quickly find a, something, uh, but it's also another aspect of the system. There has to be it has to be able to give you that answer. It's no good having a REPL and then have no idea. You know, have such a complex system that it takes you hours to find what you're looking for, or be hunting down something in logs or trying to yeah. find. Yeah. I'll have to say I've, I've found this sort of particularly difficult um, on on sort of research on research projects, um, like particularly as we, we look we look at um, as, at XT. Um, I, I find sort of you always have the back of your mind sort of how can I how can I bring down the, the, the feedback time on this, um, but particularly the areas that we that we found difficult is where you do have or, or where we do sort of spend like a day or so going into going into a paper or even like a week going into a specific research area. And that kind of thing of I, I don't know if I'm if I'm going to spend a week at this point going down a complete rabbit hole that's um, that's that's really not going to go anywhere. Well, I think there's a there's a uh, under appreciated skill in engineering that I call succession, which is I have this big problem. How do I slice it, and how do I order the slices? And we talk a lot about what we'd like at the end of that process. You know, here are the design patterns of well-constructed system, whatever. But we don't talk about in what order do we apply them and and how do we uh, minimize the waste along the way. So I'm a big believer in trying a, a, a thousand experiments that take me five minutes and a hundred experiments that take me an hour and 10 experiments that take me a day. And out of all of that, one of those is, you know, power, power laws, awesome power laws. One of those experiments is going to be vastly more successful than all the rest of them. And that's the one that I spend the week on. But, but that's a, it's a kind of a puzzle. Um, I remember, uh, so I worked a teensy, uh, interacted a tiny bit with John Carmack while I was at Facebook. And I'm red, green, colorblind. And uh, there are these glasses that give you the sensation of red and green, being able to differentiate between red and green. And unbelievable experience. The first time I put them on, I just started weeping. It was, it was, it was amazing. But I had an idea for how would you, uh, could you simulate those glasses with an, uh, an LED display? And so I brought it up to, to John, this idea, and he said, oh, you know what? Uh, take, a, take a red, green color blindness test on an iPhone and then take the same test on an Android. Like, whoa, why? But I'll do it. And I did it and I got completely different scores. And he said, well, because the, 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 you know, he just happens to know a bajillion things. I, he knew that the Android phone's LED was technically different than the iPhone's LED. And that difference would tell us whether it would even be possible to explore this idea. So he, he's an absolute master at succession. Rather than spending a month building a prototype, he says, well, here's the five-minute test that'll tell us whether it's worth spending the hour. And here's the hour test that'll tell us whether it's worth spending a day. If you look at a year's worth of that activity, it looks like he spends all his time on really important stuff. But it doesn't. He just spends very short periods of time on unimportant stuff. And, and that's a huge difference from the engineers who spend, you know, go down that. We're afraid of rabbit holes because we know that happens. We'll be fascinated and it'll turn out not to matter at all or be impossible for some reason that we could have really figured out on day one if that's what we were trying to do. So it's about find, it's about finding that sort of shortcut to that that, that question that you can answer. Um, which, which... Treating it as a puzzle, it's an engineering puzzle. It, it's a different kind of engineering than okay, I have a known good idea and I just need to execute on it. How do I efficiently execute on it? This is a 
how do I find out if this idea is good? It's totally different muscle, but it's still engineering. It's still a puzzle. You can still like get excited about, oh, and because I happen to know about option pricing and blah, 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 I can put all that together. And in five minutes, we will find out if this works. So research is just really yes, yeah. just more, just trying lots of different things. And I, I mean, that's what people characterize by research, things that are risky and get, rather get, develop than if, it, th th there's more to it than that. There's the skill of, yes, there's the trying lots of things, but there's the skill of shrinking the size of the things that you try to the absolute essence so that you can try even more things. And that, that shrinking is the thing that we don't talk about. Right. And yeah, that's, that's, an right, isn't it? that's an intellectual, that's a, that's a, a skill to learn about take reducing something to its you know something that will give you ah oh, well we shouldn't go down further down this road because we yeah and the, the REPL is a great example of a tool if you get good at the REPL like there's a skill it, watching somebody who's really good with the REPL is just like amazing and there's a skill to it and learning that that has nothing to do with writing production code right it happens to use the same syntax, but who cares? It's it, there's there's this skill of being able to go from well, I have this question in the world. What do I type? What's the least I can type to get the answer to that question? And it's not a skill we teach. It's not a skill we celebrate. It's not something that we talk about, but it's tremendously important because it's that it's that flip side of finding out what to do and then doing it. Is it a skill that you think you can then, like specifically learn? Like, could you, could you have a university course on it? Or is it a skill that you've just got to refine with time and experience and like, like... Oh, no, I think it's definitely learnable. We just don't talk about it because it doesn't, it doesn't result in anything but knowledge. As opposed to, well, if I learn a new design pattern, then I write code and the code comes out better and everybody can see that. Yeah, this, this is kind of yes, yeah. uh, perhaps a new meaning to kind of test-driven development is that you're writing, you're just testing lots of different things, but you're throwing those, you know, tests away, you know, you're, you're using that to give you some knowledge. Um, so some tests you're keeping, of course, of the, the line that you are going down, but there's lots of, lots of like deviations that you, tr things that you try and say, hey, that didn't work, but that was worth a try because we learned something. Right. The thing about a REPL is once you get your answer, the... It, you have the knowledge in your head, but poof, it just, it evaporates. And a, one way to look at tests in the TDD style of testing is let's reify that knowledge that we gained inside the REPL. Okay, so I, you know, I called this function and I took the result and I applied this function to it and I took the result of that. And then I look and you, the answer is five. Okay, well, that's good. Now, I, d does it work in that case? Yes, it works in that case. If I don't do anything more, I have knowledge. Maybe I tell my pair partner, they tell somebody else, maybe we have the knowledge, fine. But but there's no, we haven't, what if that ever breaks? Well, we wouldn't know. So a way of looking at test-driven development is you take that REPL style, and, and that's in fact how I invented this is Ward Cunningham, the wiki guy, and I worked together in Smalltalk, and we had this very fast feedback, REPL style of development. And looking back on that a few years later, I realized, oh, I can just, I can just turn these things into objects, and those objects are test cases. And the expectation that the answer is five, if we did, did, did call this and call that and call that, and then what's the answer? I can make that into a tangible thing. And now I can make sure that if ever that's not true ever again in the history of the software, I'll find out about it for sure right now. So you're pres and preserving you're, history. That, that's what yes. you're, you're creating a record of the history. Of the history of my expectations. So Ken, let's talk about your new book on software design. When's the book going to be ready? Boy, I, I'm glad I didn't say the first thing that came to mind. Um, uh, it'll be in the fall.
it'll it'll be ready in the fall. I'm in the editing process now, which mostly means I'm not editing. And is it going to be is tidy first, or is it is that a working title? Have you got a? No, the the final title is uh, tidy first question mark, a daily exercise in empirical software design. So I'm trying to, again with the naming, trying to come up with a name for this style of software design that I'm talking about, which is different than speculative software design, where you make all your design decisions before you make any implementation decisions, and you have very little feedback. And reactive software design where everything's falling apart. And if we don't fix this, we're dead. That's too late. Speculative is too early. Empirical is the one where you pay attention to the actual needs of the system and you're continually shaping the system to better meet the needs as they emerge. So that's that's the, the style of design I'm talking about. And tidy first is about this particular question that comes up for every programmer 10 times a day. I have to change the behavior of this code and it's messy. Do I tidy first? And the answer is, it depends. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. And what it depends on is all of the things that affect all of software design. So the economics of it, the personal psychological experience of it you know do i do i torture myself by changing this code that's really messy or do i relieve my own pain first and then make it easy the sociology of it like how are <clears throat> the uh, scout rule are we leaving things better than we found them how much of this should I tidy? Like I'd start tidying this and I see that that also needs tidying. Do I go and do that? Yeah, the answer is probably not unless you absolutely have to per, either personally or, or for business reasons. So th it's the first in, uh, it'll be a series of books. Here's hoping. Uh, the And the first one is just about the personal experience what does software design mean to me as a developer personally? How do I use it to make my work more effective, more enjoyable, more insightful? And then the, the next scale out is, okay, we're a team of four and I'm making design changes that affect you guys. We have a relationship problem. If I just say, well, I just change the API, go update your code. You're going to, flip me the bird and, you know, so it's not enough to know about coupling and cohesion, tremendously important, but uh, we need, we te uh, teams want it, to be effective. Teams need to treat software design as a relationship exercise, not just a technical exercise. So the second book is about that team within the, the team, the geeks working together on stuff. And then the, the third proposed book is, all right, you're a team, you've got business and engineering and you've got the, you have business, the business folks, and you have the technical folks, the engineering folks. And this is a classically dysfunctional, oppositional relationship. How can you use software design to improve that relationship? The whole, we just need six months to rewrite the whole thing at the end of which you're going to have exactly what you have now. No, don't do that. Like, okay. So there is a style of design that gets both sets of needs met in that business and technical relationship. Um, I think that's, you know, going back to XP, that's, that, that came through XP. It's an empathetic design. It's how do we reduce the stress? Not, it's so many, so many teams work in saying, well, we did our bit and it's, it's those guys over there. They, they didn't release on time or they didn't, or those, um, I, you know, I, we need to change the API. It doesn't really matter. They're, you know, they'll, they'll have to rework their stuff. It's, it's how you take the whole thing holistically and say, how, how let's reduce the stress across all the groups. Let's try and minimize the amount of psychological stress that there is in the whole organization. So it's, empathy it's getting that over to you know where, so we talk about keeping apis compatible because that's empathy with the users of those apis they don't want to yeah. rewrite their systems or see their stuff break and it's it's giving people um an environments that don't surprise them or don't upset them or don't make them fearful so but across the whole organization and i think that's what what really is different about um 
what, what for me was kind of really important about your approach is that it, it took the whole thing as a holistic as a holistic whole rather than making individual developers say, hey i'm good i know I, i've satisfied my need to or my ego or my 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 need to, for, for myself it's a sort of selfish want to have been shown oh i did my stuff i got to my target i got to my deadline and those other you know and we all have those battles those politics at work but actually it's it's about thinking more empathetically and, and we had the cubicle as the physical embodiment of that isolation I used to carry a set of Allen wrenches around with me to consulting engagements. And, and one of my catchphrases was the first thing we do is rearrange the furniture, which gets you in trouble with facilities and leads to all sorts of uh, hijinks. But there you go. We need to enforce this isolation. We need to enforce this, this sense of uh, everybody's in this for themselves and they're alone because that's going to make things better for all of us together. It's a really nonsense. Really it made, trying to decode the thinking that went into those decisions, you, you can't. Drive you nuts. Well, I mean, just to, to sort of wrap up and sort of bring this kind of topic around by temporality, and I, th I think what people, and it's not just, you know, that, that we're, we're trying to create a database which is by temporal. We have friends doing other things, like uh, there's a, we have friends in other database companies, Terminus DB and Surreal DB, who, you know, really f focusing on trying to, to, to solve this problem. And the reason we're trying to solve it, I, th I feel, is that we want to make lives better for users. So we want this experience as a user that they, they can make mistakes with the data and they can have this reversibility and they can see what they, they can undo their mistakes. They're allowed to make mistakes because it's okay. We, we've, we've got a record of everything that happened and we can backtrack and we can, you know, going to be right. You know, people are used to be scared of turning on computers. You know, my mother wouldn't want to touch. You might, oh, I might press something and it would blow everything up. And you know, people are scared of this stuff and scared of systems. And it changes the behaviour when you know you can undo or you can you can make a mistake. And I think that that is uh, you know, partly what we're trying to do is, is make life better for for users. And we just feel this is one thing that you know we shouldn't be doing is allowing users to. Uh, Make, you know, loose things or kind of launch missiles or, you know, do things that is going to cause very, very bad things and make them feel very afraid. I'd, I'd add to that, I think the, the other thing I think we're trying to do with um, with XT is to bring bring that kind of level of feedback to the database as well. Right? So to, for, for too long, databases have been over there. Um, whereas if, if we can if we can bring, bring this notion of a, of a database that is with you in, in, in your REPL, like I, I can, the, the, the questions I'm asking of my database is because, because it's right there. Um, I think it really it really opens up that sort of that, that, that ability to I think get very fast feedback on what on what you're doing with with your data as well as with your with, with your code. Yeah, and I, I know this is a kind of one of our product you know things, but you know, but the, the schemalessness, so you're being able to just chuck in a document allows you to experiment instead of oh, I know I need to have to create a table and I need to add a column and I need to think of the is this going to be a, a date field and what what format of a date should it be and you know you have all these things that you have to do just to try a little experiment and the experiment you could you know you could five minutes later you might think no, well, that's a bad idea I won't do that but if you're uh, you know two hours into a big scheme my database migration in order to test that little idea well you're not going to do it. Yeah, and that, that's an example of this enabling the ability to defer decisions. And there's, there's intrinsic value. You create value when you make decisions, but you also create value when you make it possible to defer decisions. And I think people individually and organizations aren't prepared to recognize that. And... Uh, so, yeah, I think there, there is, seems like databases are a solved problem, right? And uh, I just don't believe it. I'm enough of a techno, I, I'm enough of a geek. I grew up in Silicon Valley, watched the microprocessor emerge. I just believe that there's so much more possible to this technology than we've achieved so far. and. uh I'm sad when I see people satisfied, geeks satisfied with it. Uh, I'd I'd love to be more 
uh, more ambitious than that. Yeah, I do think there's far too much satisfaction in our industry. People are content with um, where we are, right, rather than thinking how much things can be so much better. And uh, I think that's a, uh, you know, that's an optimistic view that, you know, we were at the very beginning of this industry and, we, and there's so much more that we could learn and do better. And we've uh, underserved many users. I mean, most people find computers still very frustrating and complicated. I think, you know, anyone who's got a mobile phone will probably identify with that. So we've got a long way to go. And uh, so it's just by piece by piece, idea by idea, we make progress. And um, I just want to say thank you, Kent, for all of these ideas that you've brought to the industry that have, have advanced us and, and, and inspired us. And, uh, and thank you very much for joining us today and, and giving your time and, and your, your thoughts and wisdom in, in, into this. Very My pleasure. What, what a delight to reconnect with you, Malcolm, and to find that we have this weird thing in common and to be able to talk about it. We have another weird thing in common, uh, Kent, actually. Uh, I, I was born in a county called Kent, um, in a town with a river running through it. You never guess the name of the river. The river was called the Beck. Isn't that strange? Isn't that Wow. Weird? Is there a place called Beckenham? It's Beck and Hamlet. I was shortened to Beckenham. It's where Emma Raducanu is from, actually, the, the tennis player. Okay. So it's a real thing. So if you've ever, never been to Beckenham in Kent, a, place, a real place like that exists. I have to, uh, now I have to go <laughs> just to walk, just to walk around. Yeah, this is my place. Yeah. <laughs> we'll give you uh, freedom of the city of Beckenham. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, thank you much, gentlemen. Cheers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ken. All righty. Talk to you later. All right. Bye. Bye.